Welcome to the next video in this series on the top 10 vampires of the great clans in Vampire the Masquerade. Today's clan is one of the two who usurped their position in vampire society, Clan Giovanni, the Clan of Death. The Giovanni's hat is that they are merchants, necromancers, and degenerates, as in, my sister can't possibly be this cute kind of degenerate, and they can't say no if they're dead kind of degenerate. The Giovanni are equal parts family, corporation, and cult. So, without further ado, let's take a look at I Vampiri Pui Famigerati della Familia, the top 10 vampires, in no particular order, of Clan Giovanni. Number 10, Claudius Giovanni. Let's start with the vampire who, for much of the clan's history, sat at the right hand of the father, very Catholic. Claudius Giovanni, son of Augustus Giovanni's body and first child of his blood. Little is known about Claudius's mortal life, save that he was born near the end of the 10th century and a citizen of Venice, intimately involved in his father's plans to usurp Cappadocius. Claudius was tasked to destroy Cappadocius' child, advisor, and protector, Japheth, who had warned Cappadocius to not embrace Augustus Giovanni. Unfortunately, Japheth was too old and too wary to be surprised by those he did not trust to begin with. A solution literally fell into Claudius's lap when he was approached by the Ventru Jadviga Almanov with a plan to slay Japheth and take his blood. What Lady Almanov did not reveal was that she was acting at the behest of the Ephorate, the ruling council of the Ventru, who hoped to replace Japheth with Augustus as Cappadocius' most trusted advisor. What Claudius did not reveal was that he and his father's true target for Diablerie was not only Japheth, but Cappadocius as well. Together, Lady Jadviga and Claudius recruited a cabal of elder vampires, one from each clan, to aid in their scheme, which became known in later years as the Conspiracy of Isaac, which is an interesting name. The biblical Isaac was nearly sacrificed by his father when, at the last moment, an angel came down and stopped Abraham, directing him to sacrifice a ram that conveniently got itself stuck in a bush, Isaac being the false sacrifice and the ram being the true sacrifice to God. Japheth is the false sacrifice, though he would meet final death anyway, but the true sacrifice was intended to be Cappadocius, who had ambitions of reaching Godhood himself. Anyway, once the conspirators were enlisted, Claudius hoped to bind their loyalty with a little party, and some party favors, 13 carefully selected mortals that they would drain dry in anticipation of tasting Japheth's potent vitae. Unfortunately, you sometimes get party crashers. Even worse when those party crashers are the founders of the Camarilla with a freshly shined boot for their asses. You see, the founders wanted the Cappadocians to join the Camarilla, and Lord Hardestad of Clan Ventru had gone to the Ephorate as well for permission to attack Claudius. The Ventru, deciding to play both sides, allowed Hardestat to attack, figuring that whoever won would be under their influence. Claudius and the conspiracy of Isaac panicked, and rather than dining on the hapless mortals at their leisure, embraced them and fled the castle, hoping that their newly created fledglings would buy them time. According to the Giovanni, Claudius managed to diablerize Japheth later that year at the monastery of St. Timothy, moments before his father attacked and diablerized Cappadocius himself. After the event known to the clan Giovanni as the Bite, Claudius served as his father's agent during the negotiations and signing of the Promise of 1528, with the founders, now known as the Inner Circle of the Camarilla, who clenched their teeth and recognized the wholesale destruction of the Cappadocians as a fait accompli. No use crying over spilt milk. They recognized the Giovanni as the successors to the Cappadocians, and they pledged to stay out of each other's business. A century later, Claudius discovered an artifact called the Khazar's Diary, which described the means by which the Endless Night could be achieved. As a clan of necromancers, the Giovanni were very interested in tearing down the spiritual wall between the realms of the living and the dead, known as the Shroud, in the name of using their necromancy to rule the world. Very cartoony, but whatever. If you know anything about the setting of Wraith the Oblivion and its successor Orpheus, You'll also know why letting in what exists in the underworld is the worst fucking idea imaginable. But hey, bad guys do what they do. After sharing his new tome with Papa Augustus, Claudius raided the Cappadocian library at Erces in Turkey, 
stealing whatever he thought was useful and burning the rest. Big mistake, Claudius. When he returned to Venice, he found his father in the company of a mysterious entity called the Capuchin. Now, the Capuchin is one of those fill-in-the-blanks-as-your-story-requires characters. Is he a vampire? Is he a wraith? Is he part of the true black hand? Please consult your storyteller. Anyway, the Capuchin had a deal with Augustus Giovanni. In exchange for Giovanni lore on necromancy, it would give the Giovanni access to some very interesting secret books from the Vatican and other pieces of lore. Today, the Capuchin had a nice juicy one. Notes from Japheth, indicating that Augustus's diablery of Cappadocius had been incomplete, and that the only way for Augustus to obtain the true power of an antediluvian would be by devouring the true vessel, containing the remaining blood and soul of Cappadocius. Where was the true vessel to be found? Ereses. Guess who just destroyed Ereses? Claudius. Now guess what Claudius didn't bring back from Ereses? The true vessel. Oops. Claudius was on the receiving end of one of the most brutal beatdowns in the history of Vampire. To put it simply, Augustus bashed his son's skull to pieces with his bare hands. Big ouch. The Capuchin stood silent as Augustus vented his fury on his son, and when it was over, claimed the remains as payment for services rendered. What a mysterious entity with a taste for necromancy would need with a dead Giovanni vampire, I leave to the listener's imagination. But Claudius's corpse does turn up two centuries later in Egypt, interred in the tomb of the Cappadocian Methuselah, Lazarus. Number 9. Mariana. And now for a little more on Claudius Giovanni. You might think that burning down Ereses, the screw-up that got him brutally murdered by his own father, was his biggest mistake. Well, here's the close runner-up. He sired a child, his final child, Mariana. And Mariana is the only canon Giovanni who openly opposes the clan. In fact, she has spent over 500 years trying to destroy the Giovanni. In life, Mariana was a simple peasant who would have likely been born, lived, married, popped out a few kids, grown old, and died. But fate seized hold of her when Claudius Giovanni's ghoul, Lothar, invited her to a feast at his master's mansion. Though she imagined she was to be a guest, she was, in fact, the meal, intended for Claudius's rarefied palate. She was powerless before Claudius's dominate as he ordered her to disrobe and sit on a human-sized silver platter. She didn't even notice when Claudius had a specially designed collar attached to her neck, nor when the dagger punctured her veins and a tap was installed so that Claudius and his fellow conspirators could sample the various mortal vintages at their leisure. Mariana's fate was to die then, but for the treachery of Claudius's carriage driver and the intervention of Hardestat, who arrived at the Giovanni's castle with a contingent of battle-hardened ghouls. Mariana had already had most of her blood drained, so it was a simple matter for Claudius to embrace her and give her one final command. Fight Hardestat's soldiers to the death, theirs or hers. Yet, in the ensuing chaos, Mariana shrugged off the effects of Claudius' disciplines and escaped. She was discovered by the Cappadocians and granted refuge at the Monastery of St. Timothy, where she undertook a futile vow of silence in the vain hope that the sacrifice would free her from the curse of Cain. She was present when the Giovanni and the founders attacked the monastery, as well as the Diablery of Cappadocius. Mariana fled east into Asia for a time, where it is rumored that she studied the secret death arts of the Middle Kingdom and the underworld of the Asian dead, the Yellow Springs. When she returned to Europe, she was firmly on the path to fight against the Giovanni who had created her at all costs. Since then, she has been a lone hunter of Giovanni vampires, killing many in her 500-year career. Her journey has been guided and protected by none other than the spirit of the slain Cappadocius himself, who led her to Ereses before its destruction by Claudius. She studied the lesser key of Cappadocius, teaching her several thaumaturgical and necromantic abilities that even the Giovanni do not possess. At times, she felt overwhelmed by Cappadocius' presence. At others, she felt utterly alone. Though the other vampires who were embraced by the conspiracy of Isaac, calling themselves the children of Isaac, have aided Mariana and she them, 
she does not consider herself one of them. Mariana's struggle of five centuries came to an end in 1972 in Boston, Massachusetts. During an ambush set up by Andreas Giovanni, the capo of the Giovanni in Boston, Mariana was apparently killed in the fight, though the details remain scarce as to exactly how. Some suggest that she was killed by evil wraiths called specters. Others say that she embraced a child of her own before giving up her life and ascending to heaven. Yet, Mariana's legacy outlived her. In 1999, the remaining children of Isaac laid the soul of Cappadocius to rest, using a ritual Mariana spent decades researching, but did not live long enough to complete. Number 8. Ginevra Giovanni One of the popular talking points of Camarilla flunkies is how their myriad enemies are all united. The Sabbat are united. The Asimites are united. The followers of Set are united and the Giovanni are united. Therefore, the Camarilla must also be united, usually said by someone who means for the listener to unite under their leadership. And the Giovanni work hard to present such a front, but it is like flowers in a cemetery, hiding the rotting corpses beneath the ground. And such was the life of Ginevra. To the peasants of Italy, she was a noblewoman, to be obeyed without question. She was praised for her beauty and courted by handsome suitors, but by night, she was a lowly menial in the crypts and catacombs of the Giovanni. Her family was just one of many whose purpose was to carry out the Giovanni's will in the mortal world, while in the true circles of power, where the immortals and the necromancers held authority, she existed only to serve their whims and suffer their abuses. On top of that, her family was outside of the orbit of even the cadet branches of the Giovanni family, meaning that she would never be considered for the proxy kiss, or gouldom, much less the embrace and full membership in the Giovanni. Ginevra, like many power-hungry people, believed in her own importance and that she was destined for immortality. A clue to her mindset is present in the diary she wrote, I refuse to watch my youth sour and my beauty sag while the keys to eternity are within my sight but just out of my reach. At first, Ginevra actively ingratiated herself to certain members of the Giovanni family both mortal and immortal. But being a family of incestuous necromancers who obtained their power thanks to an abundance of wariness and paranoia, most of them easily saw through her flattery and lust for power and rejected her out of hand. But not all. An elder but weak-willed Giovanni named Del Giorgio was taken in by her puffing of his ego and her frankness, rekindling something long dormant in his ancient blood. But. Del Giorgio's equally immortal wife, Carmina, as is often the case of women, saw through Ginevra's feminine wiles and forbade Del Giorgio from embracing Ginevra. To further flex her muscle, Carmina had Ginevra whipped and sent along word that should any of the family's necromancers have need of, uh, live subjects to experiment on, Ginevra would make an excellent candidate. Humiliated and faced with what would likely be a slow, painful death, followed by an eternity of enslavement as a wraith, Ginevra went to the only force that could touch the Giovanni in Italy, the Inquisition, and offered them the <clears throat> queen of the Giovanni vampires, Carmina. It was a perilous gambit, one that could have seen her destroyed by either side if her treachery were discovered, but she managed to smuggle a team of inquisitors past Carmina's ghoul bodyguards and into her sanctum where the Inquisitor staked and decapitated Del Giorgio's wife while he slept in a crypt in the next room. Ginevra rushed them back out before anyone could raise the alarm. To complete the deception, Ginevra pierced her own body with one of the Inquisitor's stakes. When Del Giorgio rose from torpor and discovered the remains of his now completely dead wife, rage and grief overcame what little reason he had to begin with. Ginevra told the old Giovanni that the Inquisitor snuck in and attacked Carmina, that she had tried to defend her mistress, but there were too many of them, and they nearly killed her as well. Del Giorgio was taken in by the lie, and rewarded Ginevra's bravery <clears throat> with the embrace. Since then, Ginevra took up much the same role as Carmina once had, henpecking Del Giorgio to get him to agree to her will. To the Giovanni, she was not only a mere neonate who had no place in their crypts, but she was an outsider, not truly one of the family. 
Ginevra called on the Inquisition again, telling them that the death of Carmina had irreparably damaged the Giovanni's power, but there were still holdouts, still servants of the Queen of the Giovanni Vampires. These Giovanni, her most vocal opponents, were betrayed one by one into the hands of the Inquisition. Ginevra cultivated her contact with the Inquisition into a greater influence with the Catholic Church in Italy. She used this influence to point the Inquisition away from the Giovanni family as a whole and towards others such as foreigners, heretics, witches, peasants, and non-Giovanni vampires. Using Del Giorgio's status, she strong-armed the necromancers into inducting her into the necromantic mysteries of the clan, granting her not only status, but magical power as well. Her Giovanni enemy suspected her alliance with the Inquisition, but could not prove it, and Del Giorgio was an elder, so his decisions, or rather, Ginevra's decisions coming out of his mouth, could not be disobeyed. But as the power of the church, and subsequently the Inquisition waned, Ginevra made another, rather more dangerous alliance with the Sabbat, and the Black Hand specifically. In exchange for resources and necromantic assistance, the Black Hand dedicated some of the deaths they caused to the Giovanni, channeling the souls of the slain directly to Ginevra. But Ginevra slipped up somewhere, and her duplicity came to the attention of the worst vampire possible, Augustus Giovanni himself. In 1999, Augustus instructed his Anziani, the Council of Elders, to send Ginevra to Boston, supposedly to stabilize the territory and cultivate allies in the newly established Camarilla Princedom of New York. He also sent a message ahead to Francis Milliner in Boston, head of the Milliner branch of the Giovanni, that he had permission to kill and diabolize Ginevra for her betrayals. The Milliners ambushed Ginevra on the street, riddling her with bullets. She tried to escape into the subway, but more milliners were waiting for her there, nearly taking her skull apart with gunshots. A crossbow bolt to her heart held her incapacitated, while Francis Milliner devoured Ginevra's blood and soul. And that's why you never, ever go against the family. Number 7. Kenneth Stahl So you may be a little perplexed why a guy named Milliner is considered a Giovanni. Well, despite the Giovanni preference for a family tree with no branches or forks, Augustus has seen the wisdom of acquiring other families in the same way that a large corporation might buy out smaller corporations and make them subsidiaries rather than incorporating them into the larger corporate structure or stripping them of assets. And there are a number of such subsidiary families of the Giovanni. Milliner, St. John, Rothstein, Dunsern, Pisanob, Putanesca, Rosinelli and Della Passalia, to name some of the larger ones. Kenneth Stahl is a member of the Giberti family, once Italian but infused with Dutch and African bloodlines thanks to their participation in slave trading, weapon smuggling, and mercenary work. On the mystical side, the Giberti are the creators of the Cenotaph Path of Necromancy, which permits a necromancer to manipulate a wraith's fetters. Now without getting too deep into wraith lore, a fetter is an object in the mortal world important to a wraith that allows them to hang around near the mortal world and interact with it. Destroy a wraith's fetter and the wraith either falls into oblivion or is stuck in the underworld. But back to Kenneth Stahl. Stahl was born in 1645 to Dutch and African parents respectively. He was brought into the family business early and excelled. His primary area of responsibility was smuggling weapons into the hands of Dutch settlers in Cape Colony, which they would put to good use in pacifying the native Khoisan people. This relationship opened up Cape Colony for other investments by the Giberti, further enriching the family. In 1680, when Stahl was 35 years old, he was granted the embrace by Henry of Saxony and dispatched to join the primary Giovanni operation in Cairo, Egypt. Stahl acquitted himself well in Giovanni business, rising to the number two position behind the capo of the city, Federico Giovanni. But then Mariana arrived in Cairo and lopped Federico's head clean off, which put Stahl in the boss's chair and gave him the responsibility for catching Mariana. Needless to say, he did not succeed. Stahl's ultimate fate in the modern nights is unknown. The operations of the Giberti family in the Nile port were burned out by parties unknown, 
with only a single ghoul escaping the blaze. And the Prince of Cairo, Mukhtar Bey, has forbidden any new entree into his city by the Giovanni or their branch families. Number 6. Isabel Giovanni The career of the usual Giovanni vampire follows a particular path. Birth, childhood, generous amounts of incest, necrophilia, child molestation, drugs, necromancy, earning for the family, ghouldom, even more degenerate acts, more earning for the family, and finally, the embrace. In that respect, Isabel is the classic Giovanni. She was neck deep in the most unsavory practices of the clan in her mortal life, even going so far as to pull a Circe Lannister and let her brother put a baby in her. After doing a short run as a teen mom to her brother's three-legged baby, Isabel earned the proxy kiss. It took Isabel two decades of, to work her way up from ghoul to vampire, thanks to her skills in necromancy and diplomacy. In 1714, Fortunato Giovanni gave Isabel the embrace. Since then, she has worked faithfully for the clan as both a diplomat and an infiltrator. As a diplomat, she is the public face of the clan to the Camarilla. As an infiltrator, she has possibly over a dozen identities across North America and even sits on the Primogen Council in a few cities. But whatever face she wears, she can gain entrance into the conclaves and councils of the Camarilla almost without effort. When infiltrating Camarilla cities, she usually masquerades as a Toreador or Ventru, as theirs are the clan weaknesses that are easiest for her to fake. The rumor that follows Isabel is her unusual feeding habits. Specifically, Isabel has a preference for drinking blood, provided by one of the members of the blood cults that she has nurtured across America. Specifically, she drinks blood from their severed heads. Now, supposedly she does this to get around having to identify herself as a Giovanni, thanks to the Lamia's curse, which causes pain and harm instead of pleasure to those she feeds from, a curse that allegedly afflicts all Giovanni, although racking up a collection of severed heads every time one feeds would do more to expose one's identity than a few perpetually injured mortals. Of course, since only a handful of vampires have ever actually observed her feeding and none of them are non-Giovanni, it remains but a rumor. On the other hand, her picture in the original clan book Giovanni depicts her using a human head as a sippy cup, so if it's not a compulsion, it's at the very least a preference. Number 5. Marciana Giovanni Speaking of the Giovanni diplomacy, allow me to introduce a Giovanni who has supposedly stepped across the line of the clan in favor of the Camarilla, Marciana Giovanni. She is, to put it briefly, the Miss Marple of Clan Giovanni and the Camarilla. But unlike Dame Agatha Christie's famously amiable amateur detective, who relies on a network of gossipy spinsters and her suspiciously accurate intuitions about human nature, Marciana Giovanni relies on investigative and forensic techniques, as well as the ability to interrogate the victims of murders who have gone over to the underworld. In life, Marciana was a flighty young girl, a child of one of Venice's most affluent families. She was a fixture in the soirees of the nobility and the merchant class, heedless of the unsavory rumors that occasionally followed her family name, which were always barely uttered above a whisper. This included occasional visits at night to her family manor by pale men who introduced themselves as distant uncles. On Marciana's 19th birthday, her father took her to the family mausoleum where she was introduced to the truth about her family, what their real business was, and what would be expected of her going forward. The social butterfly perished in that tomb, and what emerged was a faithful disciple of Clan Giovanni. Marciana poured herself into her studies on international finance and necromancy. After about 20 years of intense study and scrutiny, the elders of the clan judged her worthy of the embrace and brought her into the clan proper in 1924. Her true talent had yet to blossom. While on a mission to visit a heroin contact of the clan, she found the man dead in his office with a large G painted on the wall in the victim's blood, circled and slashed out. Since the man was her contact and she had been the one to discover the body, she was assigned to identify the killer. After some consideration, Marciana raised the man's ghost with the sepulchral path of necromancy for a little interview. 
Using clues gathered from the ghost, she identified his murderer as another vampire, a Toreador looking to monopolize on the local heroin trade. Marciana tracked the Toreador to his haven. She then arranged for other, more violent members of the clan to call upon him and explain his mistake to him in excruciating detail. Having recognized Marciana's undeveloped potential, the Giovanni sponsored her studies in investigative techniques, forensic medicine, and law. When her studies were complete, the Giovanni, through intermediaries, put out the word that Marciana was available for hire as an investigator to the Camarilla. And her skill as an investigator, along with her necromancy, have managed to close cases that baffled the Justicars and the Archons. But Marciana Giovanni has two rules for her clients. First, she never charges fees for her services. She simply asks that her clients return the favor when she calls on them. Second, if and when she does call on her clients to redeem a favor, that they keep the nature of her request confidential. Her effectiveness and confidentiality have built her a web of contacts within the Camarilla that extends from Europe to North America, from street-level neonate coteries to the highest levels of the Camarilla, the inner circle, who, unbeknownst to each other, are all in her debt to some extent. If they ever realize just how deep Marciana's ties go, they might see fit to remove her, but she takes great pains to present herself as no threat to the Camarilla and, in fact, she presents herself as having no ties to the Giovanni apart from her name, that she is an ostracized member of the clan for some undisclosed infraction, which in turn makes her clients even more likely to trust her and protect her secrets. Of course, this is just a ruse. Marciana is fanatically loyal to the clan and is in the perfect position to cause havoc within the Camarilla should the clan give her the word to do so. Number 4. Paolo Sardenzo Vampire politics is a dangerous business, and Giovanni politics may be more dangerous than that, if such a thing is possible. And no one epitomizes just how hard it is to almost reach the top, and then fail, than Paolo Sardenzo. He was a diplomat in life, and a member of the Giovanni on the distaff side, who took after the necromantic interests of his mother's family. In 1821, Diego Giovanni made him a ghoul. Paolo successfully played the Camarilla and the Sabat against one another in Italy, using the revolutionary societies active in Italy at the time, with the ultimate goal being to throw the Austrians and their Ventru patrons out of Venice. Now, the Ventru prefer to keep all of their disagreements in-house, but there are factions within the Blue Bloods on ideological and national lines, and Paolo knew about these factions. So he paid a call on the Ventru of Prussia to offer secret support in their war against Napoleon III of France and Napoleon's La Sombra and Toreador backers in exchange for a little help with the Giovanni's Austrian problem. With Italy finally united in 1866 and the Austrians kicked out of Venice, Paolo was rewarded for his role with the embrace in 1867 under Giovanni del Giorgio. The embrace didn't slow him down one bit as he brokered deals between the Giovanni and the Gangrel and Nosferatu of Europe who occasionally found themselves strapped for cash. During World War I, Paolo, by then a master necromancer and aware of Augustus' scheme to bring about the endless night, decided that the tools of total war were the perfect means of harvesting souls for the clan's ultimate victory. He swam through the battlefields of Europe like a shark gobbling up the souls of the dead as quickly as his necromantic traps could allow. Unfortunately for the otherwise handsome Paolo, an errant shell hit one of his havens, exposing him to the cold, cleansing light of day. Paolo survived by frantically burrowing himself into the earth, but the damage was already done. The left side of his face and his left arm bear the horrendous scars that he would carry with him into the modern nights, giving him a kind of Harvey Dent two-face aesthetic. Despite this figurative and literal loss of face for Paolo, he was undeterred and pressed for the clan to tear down the shroud between the lands of the living and the dead, even after Valentina della Passaglia returned from the underworld to warn the Giovanni of what would really happen if the shroud were to fall. Paolo suffered a further loss of favor with the clan when a group of wraiths, veterans and victims of World War I trapped by Paolo, 
managed to escape and swore vengeance against Clan Giovanni and appropriately styled themselves the Bloody Legion under the command of Gaston Bellidotti. The exploits of the Bloody Legion is detailed in Wraith, The Great War, which, if I have to do it in a full body cast, I will make a video about it. Paolo suffered a series of humiliating defeats before the Bloody Legion met its end in the Great War in the Underworld, leading to Paolo's unofficial exile from the clan. When World War II broke out, Paolo resumed beating the drum for the Endless Night ceremony. The Giovanni, more interested in the outcome of the war than in destroying the Shroud, ignored Paolo until he decided to take matters into his own hands. With a coterie of loyal followers, he set off for the Eastern Front to reap a harvest of German and Russian souls and enact the ceremony himself. The family didn't take kindly to this disobedience. A group of Giovanni members caught him, staked him, and shipped him off to Venice to face judgment after the war was over. Paolo's unlife was spared at the behest of Diego Giovanni, though his punishment was twofold. First, he was to be blood bonded to his former Domitor, Diego, who had sponsored him and also suffered a loss of face due to Paolo's actions. Second, Paolo was to remain staked until such time as Diego decided to free him. A stake in the heart and stuffed in a box, otherwise known as Vampire Timeout. And it was a nice long timeout of about 40 years. In 1985, Diego ordered Paolo freed from the stake and gave him another chance, so long as he stopped his tinkering in the underworld. Paolo agreed. Not only did Paolo keep what was left of his nose clean, he made himself useful to Diego in the 15 years after the stake was removed. Paolo quickly acclimated himself to modern society and technology, and even convinced Diego to make some modest tech investments that became very lucrative. Now Diego is still wary of Paolo, but finds himself relying on Paolo more and more, especially in the wake of the sixth great maelstrom in the underworld. Number three, Enzo Giovanni. The Ghostbusters always warned us to never cross the streams, but we're about to do just that. Those streams are Vampire the Masquerade and Werewolf the Apocalypse. And at the intersection of these two streams is Enzo Giovanni. Outsiders to the clan believe Enzo to be one of the most premier members of the clan, which is just what the Giovanni want, because the true power of the clan is in Venice, in the mausoleum, as it always has been. Enzo is a member of the main branch of the family and received the embrace in 1871. As CEO of Irish Eyes Enterprises Limited in London, England, Enzo controlled a modest media empire in English print and was beginning to invest in retail franchises. But his unlife was changed forever when the elders tapped him to be their candidate for a seat on the board of the huge multinational holding corporation, Pentex. In August of 1993, a pack of lupines led by a ghetto Fenris named Shadow Walker assassinated three members of the board of Pentex at the annual shareholders meeting in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Enzo, despite his modest success by Giovanni standards, was considered expendable and his role for the clan was to serve as a visible target for the Giovanni's enemies, including those within Pentex, so that when they investigated Enzo or tried to strike him, they would be exposed for the Giovanni to destroy. And if Enzo somehow got on the board, then he would be the mouthpiece for the clan. It is a poor chess player who refuses to sacrifice a pawn or two. Enzo was kept blissfully unaware of his elder's true plan and threw himself into the campaign for the board with gusto. Two of Enzo's opponents for one of the three open seats were Catherine Mullet, CEO of Alliance Industries, and Maximilian Toner, CEO of Orboros Distributions. Enzo had prior dealings with both and was actually in the process of a hostile takeover against Mullet by secretly acquiring shares of stock in her company. Although Mullet was in the lead for votes, she knew that she could not campaign and fend off Enzo's hostile takeover of her company. Toner was as hard up for votes as Enzo. The board members were fully aware of what exactly Enzo was and the clan's plans for him and did not want a Giovanni on the board of their company. They attempted to assassinate Enzo by manipulating another member of the Geta Fenris into attacking him, but Enzo survived the attack and took refuge with an ally in Milwaukee. Realizing how serious the race had gotten, Enzo invited Mollet and Tonner to a meeting and made them an offer they couldn't refuse. 
and alliance for the three open board seats. Toner agreed almost immediately, but Mollick conditioned her offer on Enzo's stoppage of the takeover of her company. With the alliance in place, and after Enzo recovered from the werewolf attack, he politicked hard for votes, meeting with individual shareholders to introduce himself, pressing the flesh, and picking up enough votes until he was in second place. Toner, even with the alliance, was still out of the top three and threatened to withdraw from it. Enzo took Toner aside and made him a new offer. Shares of Irish eyes in exchange for his votes going to Mollet and Enzo. Toner's votes would make Enzo and Mollet a lock for the board, and Toner agreed. But now, Mollet began to fall out of the lead as other candidates engaged in a shameless campaign of flagrant vote buying. Enzo reacted by campaigning for Mollet, shoring up her lead at the expense of his own position. Then Toner turned around and stabbed Enzo in the back by casting all of his votes for Mollet alone, bumping Enzo out of the top three. But Enzo had one card left to play. He switched gears to discredit the vote-buying candidates that were ahead of him. When the final ballots were cast, the new board members of Pentex were Catherine Mollet, Francesco, one of the members of the Black Spiral Dancers tribe, and Enzo Giovanni, the only member of the board not in service to the worm of corruption, though the board members were certain that that would change in time. And change it did. Pentex bound him tight to them by acquiring Irish eyes and uh, removing Toner's interest in the company as only an obscenely rich and spiritually corrupt international conglomerate can do. They say suicide is painless. Now Enzo had nowhere else to go, and Enzo was desperate for power, making him a prime target for Mastrak, the urge worm of power. As he bent to the will of his new ally, he found his personal power growing. Now Enzo had never been much of a necromancer, but now he found that not only was his mind open to the deeper mysteries of necromancy, but that he also gained insights into the workings of thaumaturgy as well. And now, the bait that the Giovanni had laid for their enemies has become a liability for them. Enzo Giovanni has all but abandoned his clan, which has led to calls from some elders to have Enzo taken out of the picture. Enzo doesn't believe that he has betrayed his clan, and he is unaware of just how deep his corruption runs. Yet the time will come when, if forced to choose between the good of Pentex and the Giovanni, he will side with Pentex and the invisible friend who has done so much good for him, at least as far as he knows. And all he had to do was give up his soul. Number two, Dante Putanesca. Ah, Las Vegas, playground for the rich and poor alike. But when Dante Giovanni Putanesca was born in 1903 on the south side of Chicago, Las Vegas was nothing but a spot in the Mojave Desert with an old fort that the Mormons used as a way station between Salt Lake City and Los Angeles. When Dante came of age, he went into one of the few lucrative businesses open to tough, ambitious young Italians in the 1920s, organized crime. Dante was a young up-and-comer in the organization who came to the attention of one of his great uncles from the old country, from Napoli, dispatched by the Giovanni to put their American affairs in order, Lorenzo Putanesca. Lorenzo was impressed by Dante and gave him the proxy kiss, making him his ghoul. But Lorenzo had a falling out with the Prince of Chicago, Loden, and moved across the country to sunny Los Angeles. Now despite being in Tinseltown, Dante remained a gangster at heart and soon fell in with LA's bookmaking and gambling rackets. In a strange twist of fate, gangsters, real or fake, were all the rage in Hollywood at the time, and Dante soon found himself invited to the best parties, award shows, and movie premieres with all of the industry bosses and stars. Hmm. The more things change, the more they stay the same, I guess. It was inevitable that Dante would make the acquaintance of Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, the founding father of Murder Incorporated, and the personal hatchet man for the New York crime bosses Charles Lucky Luciano and Meyer Lansky. The New York hitman and the Chicago soldier quickly became friends, given their mutual business circles and similar interests in fast cars, beautiful women, and stacks of cash. But Siegel had another interest, a dream rather, 
and that dream was the Flamingo Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. It would be the biggest, classiest joint in the world that would pull in vacationers and high rollers from across the country. Additionally, it would be an excellent front for the commission to launder its illicit cash. Dante, dazzled by Siegel's dream, begged Lorenzo to front Siegel a million dollars, which in today's money would be over $11 million. Lorenzo, despite being a thrifty old vampire, was willing to take a chance on Dante and put up the money. But the Flamingo flopped less than a month after opening, but it reopened two months later and slowly began to turn a profit, but not fast enough. Now, it's one thing to waste the Mafia's money, it's a whole other thing to waste the Giovanni's money. And Lorenzo made clear to Dante that Siegel's life was forfeit, and not only was Dante forbidden to do the job himself, he could not intercede on Bugsy's behalf. He couldn't beg for his life. He couldn't make a case for Siegel. Dante had to choose between his friend and his patron. On June 20th, 1947, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel was shot to death in his Los Angeles home through a window. The killer was never identified or captured. Now, Dante could have very easily met the same fate as Siegel, but the Flamingo, now renamed the Fabulous Flamingo, soon began practically printing money, turning a profit of $4 million in 1948, which would be about $42 million today. As a reward for Dante's foresight and, more importantly, his obedience, Lorenzo put Dante in charge of the Giovanni's interest in the Flamingo. Dante frequently traveled between Los Angeles and Las Vegas and watched, dazzled as an oasis grew up in the desert around the Flamingo, his dead friend's dream come true. Dante vowed that he would make Las Vegas his home if he ever received the embrace. Unfortunately, the Camarilla saw that the money was coming in and quickly moved in to set up shop in Las Vegas, establishing Benedict of Clan Ventru as Prince of Las Vegas. The Giovanni, being scarce in the western United States, didn't have the muscle to push the Camarilla back, and Dante was forced out of the city. But by this time, Lorenzo had gotten his money back, along with a tidy profit, and rewarded Dante with the embrace for his shrewd and unorthodox thinking. In the 1980s, Dante left Los Angeles to make his own way in the world. He went back to Chicago for a while, and then to Baton Rouge, and finally Atlanta. But everywhere he went, his temper tended to make him more enemies than friends. In the case of Atlanta, he had to make a hasty exit when the Sabbat invaded the city. Dante thought back to the old days with Bugsy. Vegas was where he belonged. Vegas was his destiny. And he would make Benny's dream come true again. Dante reached out to the Anziani, the Council of Elder Giovanni who oversee the clan, with a proposal. $1.4 billion to build the world's greatest casino, resort, and hotel. With all of the style and elegance of old world Europe, with a 500,000 square foot indoor retail mall, a 65,000 square foot spa, 12 upscale restaurants, cigar bars and martini bars, a 3,036 room hotel, and the centerpiece of it all, a 116,000 square foot casino with 110 tables and 2,500 slot machines. Give the boy credit. If given a choice between going big or going home, Dante Putanesca goes big. Now the Anziani were leery of the proposal at first, but Lorenzo supported Dante. Perhaps this was out of affection for Dante. Perhaps it was out of the hope that Dante's quick temper and violent ways would undermine the position of Shlomo Rothstein, the Giovanni Capo of Las Vegas and child of Lorenzo's hated rival, Giulietta Putanesca. The other elders considered Lorenzo's support and the plan. Visionaries rarely make good rulers, and Dante was too flashy and temperamental to stay in charge of his little kingdom in the desert for long. Dante would, inevitably, piss someone off, whether it was the Camarilla, or Rothstein, or one of the Anarch gangs of Las Vegas, and they would snuff him out, at which point the clan could step in and put his operation under proper, reliable, and most importantly, discreet management. The plan was approved, and on May 3, 1999, the Venetian resort, hotel, and casino had its grand opening. Whether Dante Putanesca becomes the king of Sin City, or dies for his dream of a palace in the desert, only time will tell. 
Number one, Ambrogino Giovanni. Ambrogino Giovanni is an enigma within Clan Giovanni. A bastard son of a disfavored branch of the Giovanni family, Ambrogino has risen, to put it biblically, to sit at the right hand of the father, Augustus. Ambrogino became a vampire through his own lust for power and mastery of necromancy, which brought him to the attention of the Cappadocians without the intervention of Augustus. In the course of his mortal studies of conjuration and necromancy, he journeyed to Tibet, where he acquired the dark artifact called the Preta Shunyata in exchange for the sacrifice of his body. Centuries later, Ambrogino still wears the Preta Shunyata on his left arm, a withered, twisted-looking talon. With Ambrogino's sire being the Cappadocian Constantia, not only is Ambrogino one of the premises of Clan Giovanni, he may be the only Giovanni, aside from Augustus, to not have received the embrace from a member of the Giovanni family. Ambrogino Giovanni is a driven man, driven by his own desire to achieve apotheosis, to attain godhood through necromancy. Ambrogino's ambition, his power, his treacherousness, his recklessness, and more importantly his successes, may be why Augustus has granted Ambrogino carte blanche in his pursuit of apotheosis. Of course, he intends to betray Augustus and claim divinity for himself, but the old man doesn't need to know that, at least not until it's too late to do anything about it. Now, Claudius Giovanni and Ambrogino Giovanni were enemies even before they were embraced. Claudius stated, openly, that Ambrogino was a lowly bastard, embraced by a Cappadocian, and that he reached far above his station in life and in death. Ambrogino held his own counsel about Claudius because criticizing Claudius might be interpreted as criticism of Augustus, but Ambrogino thought Claudius was a pampered imbecile, wholly incompetent at wielding the power he was born into, and lacking in any subtlety or finesse. Ambrogino was proven right when Augustus himself destroyed Claudius, though he made sure to keep his own ambitions carefully concealed from the old man, lest he suffer the same fate, though he knows Despite Augustus's stolen antediluvian blood, the old man is fallible, and Ambrogino's plans depend on that fallibility. Now for the last three centuries, Ambrogino Giovanni has pursued a document called the Sargon Fragment, a piece of the larger Sargon Codex, a document penned by the late antediluvian Cappadocius, containing his plans for diablerizing God. Yes, Cappadocius wanted to kill God and take his place very Highlander-esque. But while Ambrogino doesn't believe that God actually has a neck to bite into or blood to suck, he does believe that Cappadocius was close, close to achieving something akin to godlike power before Augustus diablerized him. Ambrogino's search for the document has brought him into the conflict with the Camarilla, and things got hot, to put it mildly. Sometime on September 2nd, 1666, a coterie of vampires affiliated with the Camarilla, the children of Isaac, broke into the mansion of Ambrogino's premier ally in London, Andre Malat, seeking evidence on the Sargon fragment. Malat discovered the intruders and transformed himself into a fire elemental. By the time the Great Fire of London was finally put out, most of the old city within the old walls had burned, and 200,000 people had been displaced. Ambrogino escaped the city, but the Sargon fragment was destroyed in the fire, and things between the Camarilla and the Giovanni were tense for a very long time, though the Settites and the Tremere received the majority of the blame. In 1680, Ambrogino claimed credit for the death of Maria Asuncion, the last Cappadocian, well, the last Cappadocian loyal to Cappadocius. Lazarus and Angelique apparently don't count, in 1882, Ambrogino's hunt turned up a text titled The Anahexaton, a document that supposedly explained how apotheosis could be achieved. He returned to the mausoleum to decipher the text and allow some of the heat that he had accrued in his mad dash around the world to cool. When he wasn't working on unlocking the Anahexaton, Ambrogino scoured the underworld for the artifact form of the Sargon fragment. Now those who understand the lore of the underworld and the doings of the restless dead know that certain items, destroyed in the mortal world, can appear again in the underworld in the form of relics, the memory of the object or thing that was destroyed, just as wraiths are the memories of dead mortals. 
Ambergino spent decades scouring the underworld through scrying and dispatching Wraith servants to search for the Sargon Fragment. But in 1999, he witnessed the near total destruction of the underworld during the Sixth Great Maelstrom. The civilizations of the dead had been destroyed and the survivors, or what was left of them, were flung through the underworld like raindrops in a storm. Some had even penetrated the shroud and entered, against their will, various objects, corpses, and even people in the mortal world. Ambrogino, more curious than disturbed, ripped several of the shrieking, broken ghosts from such objects as they had taken shelter from the storm in the mausoleum and harshly interrogated them. The gibbering, wailing wraiths revealed that the destruction of the underworld was preceded by the appearance, and apparent ascension, of three glowing beings. Ambergino wanted to know what they looked like, where they had gone to, and other information. But when the wraiths could not answer any more of his questions, he simply had them destroyed. After a week of reflection, Ambrogino departed from the mausoleum on a journey to the ruins of Ereses. The last words he said before leaving the mausoleum, Perhaps Cappadocius was right all along. So, that was the top ten members of Clan Giovanni, the Clan of Death. As should be clear from the sample of clan members, the Giovanni are united not only by common blood, but by a common lust for power, both in the material and spiritual realms. Next on the to-do list is the Clan of Shadows, the La Sombra. Until next time.